everybody. This is the ESOP guy. We are on a journey to an ESOP. I'm so excited to uh, publish this next podcast. Uh, this topic today is is in the category of ESOP experience. So actually interviewing a client who went through the whole ESOP process, I think it's really valuable for people to understand like what we're, what, what the, uh, the companies think, what the shareholders think as they go through the process. So that's what we're going to do today. If you have questions about ESOPs, go to our website at journeytoanesop.com. And if you like the podcast, please rate and review it um, on Apple or whatever media that you're using. And so with all of that, we're, we appreciate you joining the podcast, listening to today. If it is your first time, um, thank you guys for, for joining and we will get rolling. So today we're going to interview Mark Stevens. He is the chairman of the board of a company out of Atlanta called Georgia Spa. And Mark had gone through his transaction just recently, um, but I wanted to say thank you so much for joining today, Mark. Yeah, I appreciate the chance to give my, tell my story and talk a little bit about ESOPs. I, I, I didn't realize a few years ago I'd be this excited about an ESOP, but I'm, I'm very excited to share my experience and cool. and just what it's done for me personally and, and our company. So cool. thank you for having me. All right. Well, as we get started, Mark, um, it will be helpful for everybody to know what is your favorite movie and why as part of our normal icebreaker. You know, there's a lot of them, but I, I think recently, uh, Band of Brothers is not, not really a movie, but a series. I love Band of Brothers and, uh, I had a chance recently to go to Normandy and, and sort of see some of the towns and the, and the, and the way that the, uh, 101st Airborne Division landed, uh, jumped into Normandy and, and how that whole thing came together. So that was a great movie and a great story. And, and it's just, uh, puts history in perspective. So. I think really that, that I think that's cool. I think it's hard. I think it's great for those kind of movies because it helps us to remember what people paid the the cost right. of freedom and um and it has a little bit more meaning. It's not just pure entertainment, right? It's like it means something for us as as Americans. Yeah. So, well, cool. And now you're traveling too because you sold your company as an ESOP. So you're having I know you're having a a bit of fun traveling around a little bit. So. um so th- is that kind of part of, as we start the story of your ESOP, were you, were you looking to kind of get out and travel a little bit more or do you feel more freedom now that you've done it? You know, I, I don't know if it was the the travel thing. We, we, we've always done it. Myself and my wife have done a lot of traveling over the years, but uh, that's definitely a benefit of it. But uh, I, I think I was just looking for a great way to transition the company uh, and not waiting till I was in my sixties or, or, or seventies to try to, either look for an exit strategy out of the company. And I think this was the right time, the right place. And, and it gave us the opportunity to do some other things. And uh, I'm not totally disconnected with the company. So I'm still the chairman and that gives me a chance to keep my finger in the uh, pie a little bit, but I don't have to uh, be there day to day and I don't have to do the things that um, I was doing before. And it gives, it, it gives me, it gives me the peace of mind that I, I, I know what's coming over the next seven to 10 years. I, I know where I'm, I'm at and what my retirement looks like. And I think that's valuable for any business owner. So yeah, yeah. kind of, kind of a freedom. Well, so, so going into the the business, let's go through kind of like how you start, like you started the company, what you guys do. Just give us a quick synopsis of, of, yeah, of who the company quick. is. So I, I actually owned a John Deere store for a number of years, got out of that business and uh, went to work for a manufacturer and didn't really like that too much. So, uh, I decided I was going to jump back in the retail business and was looking for a product that I could sell that people wouldn't be stressed about. And uh, hot tubs came to mind. I, I knew nothing about hot tubs. I knew nothing about the industry, but I said, you know what? I know how to sell product and I know how to present product. Uh, opened a small store in 2004, uh, very small operation. Didn't realize the industry was starting a downturn, uh, especially with 2007, 2008 with the, uh, whatever we want to categorize it, the recession, the great recession or depression or whatever it was. Uh, but we were so small and had no debt that we just continued to grow. And we start, continued to take other people's pieces of the pie uh, and grew it into, you know, six store, uh, multi-million dollar business that, um, you know, and now service retail. Uh, we have, uh, you know, five delivery teams and, uh, probably 15 service techs and valet techs and just, a, it's, it's a big operation now. So it's, it's interesting to, to go 50, you know, well, 18 years later and mm-hmm. see what it's really done. Yeah. So. No, it's, it's a huge success story. And when you think about selling hot tubs, it's not, you know, if, 
I'm, I mean, I'm kind of interested in like choosing that. I know you said it was kind of like one of those products that people don't really stress about. Obviously it's the, it's the thing you get into to not stress. Right. Um, so, so going from John Deere to hot tubs, how did you actually select that as your product? Did you just see there was demand for that or you just well, like funny, funny story. So I, when I sold my John Deere business, I, I bought a hot tub. Oh, okay. Uh, and we were sitting in the hot tub one night and I said, you know, this is, this is a product I could sell. Like this is, People aren't going to get stressed out over their over their hot tub if something breaks and they need to get it repaired. Just, um, but you know, we I knew brick and mortar. I, I didn't know, you know, it, internet was still in its infancy as far as online selling at that point, point. Um, and just knew I wanted to be a specialty retailer. I, I, we wanted to get back in that business, and a lot of people looked at me and said, "Why are you doing that?" But um, you know, I, I think I had a great. We, we had a motto back then. I think we still carry it a little bit today when service and quality count. And I think that's what people look for. They they want to buy ser- great service and great quality, and they'll pay you know, above and beyond to get, to get that. And I think that's what we brought to the table that a lot of companies did not. Yep. No, I think that in knowing your story, I know that's a big key to your success. Um, but in your industry, is it is it kind of common to have that kind of growth that quickly? I mean, 18 years is, is not really that long. Uh, time no, yeah. it, it's not very common. Uh, we're, we're one of the larger uh, retailers in the hot tub industry. Um, and I, I think it's because we brought a different mindset. We, we brought a growth mindset to the, when we started the business, we knew we wanted to grow. We knew we wanted to continue to grow and, you know, right or wrong, I think a lot of people get into business and just try to figure out how to survive, how to make some money and survive. Mm-hmm. Uh, we knew we could do that because of our past experience, but we knew we wanted to take it to the next level. Um, and I think that's what drove us for a number of years. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, so in thinking about that part of the company, um, when first, when did the ESOP come to mind first for you? I mean, how many years ago was it that you thought, hey, that would be a good way to go? You know, it's probably been, Feel probably three three years ago, okay. uh, maybe a little bit longer. I had a, a good friend up in Maine that had ESOP his business in 2016. Uh, had had discussions with him, and to be quite frank with you, uh, it was way over my head. It, it, the 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 skill and knowledge set, uh, the lingo of an ESOP. You know, he would throw a lot of language out there that he assumed everybody knew what he was talking about, and people were just like, "Man, I'm, I'm just lost. Yeah. I'm lost." Yeah. But I knew I need, if I wanted to have this as a viable option, mm-hmm. uh, whether to sell to a private equity or, uh, an individual or, or whatever our decision was to, um, when we exited or had an exit strategy, uh, I knew ESOP should be at least considered. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I knew I needed to educate myself on the ins and out of it. And I, we started with going to conferences. We, we joined the NCEO and, and we, we decided we were going to go and, get a little education and, and, you know, meet some people and, and, uh, quickly realize that it was such a small knit group of people that are in the, in that, uh, industry. And, you know, it's just started meeting some great people, including yourself that, yep. you know, I, I, I've always done that in business. I, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I know where to find the smartest people. Mm, uh, cool. And I think that's what helped us get to the level where we decided we wanted to ESOP the business. Well now, and now you're an ESOP expert. So, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say expert. <laughs> well, I know you know a lot about it for sure. Um, so, so what was the, so a lot of people, they, they listen to this and they're thinking about doing, possibly doing an ESOP, whether it's this year, next year, five years from now, what was it for you? What was the catalyst for you to pull the trigger, um, on the ESOP when you did, you know, what was the main decider for you to go? Um, I, I knew I didn't want to be, I knew there was going to be an, uh, an exit runway, uh, to get out of, you know, to, to sell your business or do whatever. I knew that I didn't realize, you know, what that was going to be, but I knew it was going to be at least three to five years. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to be 65 and start the process. So I knew I wanted to, um, I just turned 56. Uh, sure. and I wanted to, uh, you know, have a plan for the next 10 years. Now, I, I, when we got into the ESOP process, I realized, you know, Hey, maybe we, we go ahead and do it now and then we, you know, see where it takes us. But, um, I don't think there was one thing. There was a lot of change in the industry, mm-hmm. in our industry. Uh, some some private equity and some public companies had jumped into the to the uh, 
to the acquisition process in our industry, which had never happened to the level that it happened probably in, in 2020, 2019, 2020. Uh, and I, I think that started me thinking that if I'm going to do something, um, you know, I need to start thinking about it quicker rather than later. So, yeah. Um, well, well, and, and, and I mean, quite honestly, when I was afraid the ESOP process had scared me because I didn't understand it. And sure. when I, when I started to realize the process and, the lingo and, and the, and all the, the things that came to be, uh, I, I realized it was the right time. It was the right, you know, I, I, I hate to see, I've got a lot of friends that are, that are older. They have no plan for exit strategy. And, and, you know, it's, it's a shame because they built great businesses, but then they have no legacy or nowhere to hand it off to. And, and that was the other part of the ESOP for us is, our culture is a little different in our company than uh, a lot of our peers out there. We wanted to uh, keep that culture. We had built a great executive team. We had built great management. We had great employees that were engaged. Um, and I, I, I thought, you know, long and hard, because I could have easily taken a check from a um, investor and, and sold the company. Uh, but I thought long and hard about where was the company going to be in 10 years, five years, 10 years. And, I thought this would be a net better for the, not only for the company, but better for me of, of my peace of mind and what I left. Yeah. You know, I was going to, that was what I was going to ask you is like, you have this, a lot of people in your shoes that look at private equity or strategic sale versus the ESOP and they're, you know, and they're kind of looking at that, like, well, what's this, pr- the pros and cons here, the pros and cons there. And I think you spoke to really a lot of things like your culture, the people that you had, you want, you didn't want to disrupt their world. And, and then what you guys built, and to be honest with you, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Your processes are pretty amazing. All that has gone into it. So with the ESOP, you felt like you could keep that intact at the same time, you know, still be kind of part of it too. You're not just like selling and leaving. So. Right. um, Right. And there's, look, my, my number two person had been with me since the start. He was my first hire. Um, and I felt like there was just some, not commitment there or obligation there, but just something that I wanted to leave for the people to help build the business. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they have a great opportunity now. They're, they're built, a lot of them are building wealth that they didn't know was even possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, the other thing too is when we got into the process and realized that, uh, either, either through banks or how, how this whole thing was going to play out and how, how I was going to get my money and stuff like that you've got to be willing to take some risk, right? We, we didn't go with the bank option. We went with the self-financing option uh, because we saw the reward there. And I have so much confidence in the team that we built over the years and our management that I didn't think there was going to be an issue with it. I, I didn't, you know, if, if, if uh, I, I felt like there was a small, very minimal risk to me, mm-hmm. uh, whichever option I went to. So yeah, no, that's a good- I was very confident in it. It's a good point. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about the financing. I want to make sure as we make sure everybody that listens and understands like this is a hundred percent sale of an ESOP. Mark didn't sell a percentage or a smaller percentage of these. So sometimes people are looking at that as a staged transaction. Mark went ahead and went from 0% to a hundred percent in the sale. Um, and so in that we did make a choice between, you know, having some bank financing or having it all seller financed and, um, what what did you see as some of the benefits to just taking on the the note yourself? I know you're taking the risk; you're the lender to the company. Um, but from a benefit standpoint, what did you see yeah. for you for yourself? Great, great question, Phil. We, you know, we, me, and you discussed through this at, at nauseum. I think so probably yeah. probably for you it was at nauseum. For me, no, it was like yeah. I gotta get this straight in my head. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the, the fact that um, it was only going to be a, a percentage of the sale that the bank was going to finance. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't, I don't remember what the exact, maybe 20%. But roughly um, 20%. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, I was still taking all the risk. I had to sign a guarantor, guarantor, uh, no, a guarantor to the, to the loan. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they failed, I would still be responsible. And so I'm, I'm still taking the risk, but I'm not getting any of the reward. And, and I looked at it and said, you know what? Why am I turning down? Uh, the interest that I would be earning for that reward when I'm not, when I'm giving that to the bank. And I just decided it wasn't worth it. It, yeah. you know, it wasn't worth the, the, the process for me to go through and, and really get the bank engaged or find a bank that would be engaged and giving up that risk, um, you know, or still keeping the risk and, and giving up the reward. So I, I just felt like for me, it was the right decision. Um, 
and, and, and I was in a little bit different position. I'm, I, I'm not going to say I don't need the money, but it, it wasn't having an immediate cash outlay to me was not important to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're very fortunate that we're, we're um, in a great place, myself and my wife, that we don't, we didn't need that influx of money. So we, we could wait over a number of years to get that back. Yeah. I can tell you that is a conversation I literally have with everybody and the same thing. And just, that's, you know, and it's, it just comes down to it, especially now that rates are so high. I mean, when rates are so high, it's like you, you're, you're thinking, well, I'm giving all that interest to the bank, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that if that's how you structured your deal. But at the same time, you know, like you said, it's why, why do that? Why don't you just pay yourself that interest? You're, yeah. you're already taking the risk. And I, I can definitely see if you were, if, 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 if you were in a position where you were, you know, late 60s, 70s, you probably want that more immediate than, than, than latter. So that's true. I, I think that it all plays into that, you know, where you're at in your life, uh, and, and what you need and what you don't need immediately and stuff like that. So yeah. Yep. Those are all parts of the decision. So in, as, as long as we're in the seller note to, uh, topic or concept, um, I know that we went through the warrant conversation a lot and discussion. Um, what made you decide to do the warrants? I know we did, did warrants on your deal, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just keeping my finger in, in on the company and, and, and knowing what they're doing and getting the reports and, and sort of dr- helping drive the strategic direction of the company as chairman of the board. Um, I felt like I should be rewarded for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I felt like I, I knew where the company what the potential is, where, where we had already driven the company to, but also know what's still available out there to where we can go next. Uh, and, and I'm a firm believer over the next five to seven years, the size of our company will double. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we're in a great position to do that. And I think that um, why would I not take some back in warrants to, to, to get that reward? Cause it, it's a shocking number. Uh, and, and I know it's very confusing at first, but it can be a shocking number if that stock value goes up, what those warrants can be worth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's one day. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, you know, in, in as much as people look at warrants and I know some people are brand new to this, they're like, what are you even talking about? So let me just say real quickly, a warrant is a synthetic equity shares that you get in combination to the interest rate on your seller note. And it's what you get compensated back in addition to the interest rate on the seller note. And so it's, it's going to be paid out in the future. So it's all at the back end. So when all the senior, all the seller debts paid off, the warrant will mature. Those, those synthetic equity shares are going to be worth the future value minus the, the strike price or the day two value in the, in the transaction. So yeah, and, and that brings up a good point. Um, Phil is, it's funny. People will say, well, what do you sell your company for? How much you, you know, they, everybody wants to know the number, right? Yeah, the they number. Do, yeah, yeah. And I always tell them, I say, well, it's, it's a little hard to say. I can tell you what, uh, I'm guaranteed to get. Mm-hmm. But my potential is, you know, it, it could it could be a lot more. And uh, if I throw that number at them, their eyes just roll back in their head. They don't understand it. But um, yeah. it's it's, you know, you, you I only I only look at what I'm guaranteed to get. Mm-hmm. You know what, right. I, what I'm going to get. But if if the warrants perform and the interest, you know, the interest between the interest and the warrants, uh, it's a substantial amount above the sale price. So yep, uh, people really have to consider that. Well, you know, and and I would just say it like from, I always try to put both both hats on. Like you got the company hat, you got your shareholder hat on, and and wanting to design an ESOP that's a win win for everybody. And the company gets a lower interest rate, so that's going to be helpful for them when they have they have all this new debt now they have to pay off and cash flows everything as we all know in business. So so they win that way, and they they also win because you're very invested in the future, like. If you, as in your, I, I think you're just a key person, right? You founded the company, you had the vision of of all the things you do strategically help the company guide itself through. So now you're really, really incented for the company to do well in the future. So that helps them too. And, and what we all care about in your company, as far as your employees go, is the future share price. So they win, the employees will win with with a warrant as well, even though the numbers might be, you know, hey, that they, they have to pay you out on that one, as well as all the other portions of it at the end of the day, they're going to be worth more too. And it's, and that's the conceptual part of like, Hey, this, they are really kind of successful. If, if everybody's in line for them, I think people that don't choose warrants are just not wanting to deal with the future value of it or the future risk of that. And they just want to make it super simple. Nothing wrong with that. But um, I think for your, your situation, um, they were perfect in terms of of building a a good win-win deal for everybody involved. 
Yeah, and, and I think the opportunity to, to help them grow the EBITDA and, and the stock price over the next five to seven, ten years is, I mean, that's that's what we want to do anyway, right? We, we want to get everybody rewarded that needs, should have been rewarded um, at some time in this sale. And, and that's how they get rewarded by growing the company mm-hmm. and, you know, this this return on their stocks and, and all the other stuff that comes along with it. I, I think, why would I not want to be involved in that? No, I know. Just, it's great. And, you know, and you're like great. You know, it's a great way for me, but it's also a great way to stay engaged. And yeah. uh, I, I didn't want to walk completely away like I could have done by, uh, you know, private equity sale. But I, I wanted yeah. to stay engaged and, and at least, you know, help drive the company. And I think I think I've done that. So No, that's great. So so kind of along the warrant conversation, other things that people will decide on are SAR shares and the SARS stand for stock appreciation rights. Um, they're part of building a management incentive plan that's really important for any ESOP that that has key people. Now, you guys have some a good number of key people that you guys are are um, have as part of your team that were there before, that are now there now, and then are, of course, going to be there in the future. Um, I, my big question is, is, is looking at, at the SAR plan, um, what was going on in your mind when, when we went through that conversation of like, who do you want to use SARS and, you know, where did you feel like there was value for, for the company itself? Cause that's more of a company planning aspect than it is a yeah. shareholder. Yeah. Great question. I, you know, I, I talked a little bit about building the management team over the last few years, but, um, I started working with a management coach about five years ago. And, and the whole reason for working with the management coach was what can we take off my plate? to be an absentee owner. It was never about selling the company. It was never about ESOP in the company. It was just, Hey, if I'm going to go spend a month in Florida, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. How how do I, how do I get to the point where I can do that? Um, so we started working on piece by piece. Mm -hmm. Who do we need to put in place? How do we need to get them trained? What kind of person are we looking for? So over those, over the last five years, we were able to put together a pretty uh, knowledgeable and, and very good, uh, management team, you know, executive team, and, and even down to some of the, uh, supervisors, like the, uh, service board, you know, service supervisor and quality control managers and these other people, key people that we thought we needed. Um, but having said that, I, I wanted to make sure when we, when we did decide on the ESOP, how were we going to keep these people either engaged, uh, part of the company? Because I knew long term success of the company was going to be key to keep these, um, people in, in the company. And I think our average tenure for those, that, that, that team is, uh, almost seven years, uh, is our average tenure. You know, when we put, we put our final piece together, this, the beginning of, of this year, uh, was the CFO. Uh, I'd always done that function in the past. We put that, that key person in, get, sort of getting him up to speed. Um, but I felt like to keep that team intact, we needed to, to reward them, mm-hmm. uh, and to drive them. And, and, uh, you know, I, I've been surprised, not surprised. I've been pleasantly, I guess pleasantly surprised over the last, uh, three or four months, how, how, how they are engaged, how intently they are engaged on looking at every financial piece of the company and, and knowing how everything ties together and, and wanting to be those people that, uh, are executives that drives the company by financials and by numbers and by, uh, we've always been a good analytic company about looking at numbers and, and knowing, you know, what drives what, and what makes things successful and what our rates are and all that kind of thing. We've always been good at that. So for them to transition over into this next piece where they were taking on that financial responsibility has been an eye opener. Really, really a great, I mean, I, I wish, I almost wish I would have uh, done the ASAP a number of years ago, but just because of that fact, because they, they're driven to, to, make the company profitable and, and run the number and get the numbers where they need to be. And they're, they're really engaged. And, and I think SARS is a big piece of that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, not only are we, are we, have we, I think we have a five year SAR plan in place where we pay them out over five years, but then we can redo SARS again. So we can, we can redo that and make that happen again for them. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they, they see the, the, the reward uh, of what, if they, if they do their job and, and are successful, what it can look like for them individually. And I think that's helped with the, with the executive team and the the key management people in the company. Yeah. And I, and I would say that is a critical success factor. When you look at some of the things that you're looking to design in the ESOP plan, um, how do you get them engaged? You know, and these are people that are going to work 
like an owner would work. And so you're already seeing the new behavior that they're looking at, you know, right. the bottom line, they're looking at costs. Um, so you want the new behavior, you want the engagement, um, and you want them to, to stick. And there, you know, that's what a SAR is for. It's really to help, you know, get the owner type of people that are like really working 10, 12 hours, you know, a day, like you would as an owner, um, to just know they have a reward behind it, you know, that it's not just for ESOP shares, which are still valuable, but this is another piece of, of comp that they're going to be able to attain if, and it's a fair proposition too, because it's going to be a vested program. So right. the company has to hit these numbers in order for them to, to actually get the shares. So. And, and personally, I, you know, I, I had a little bit of fear of, of once all this happened, it, there would be some people that left, right? There would be some it's just personality conflicts or people that just, you know, didn't believe in it or didn't, you know, didn't believe what it was in it for them and they would leave. And, and I thought this was a great way to smooth that over and help mm-hmm. maintain those people. Yep. Uh, so far, it's worked great. Uh, you know, we're, we're new into the, in, into the process. So we'll see where it goes in five years, but I, I, I don't see any. There's no negative drawback to the SARS program. I, I think it's a great way um, and a piece component of an ESOP to, to ensure that everybody's on board and, and driving the train in the right direction. So Cool, cool. So so one of the next pieces of what we would do normally is we go out and look for a trustee. And so in normal part of our process is we'll interview some trustees. You you will make the decision as as the shareholder, like who do you who do you think – you want to use how how did you experience the trustee process of finding the trustee because people get you know there's a lot of different questions about trustees like you know what are they going to do afterwards what's their role all of that stuff so how did you experience the process of hiring your your transaction trustee which is now your ongoing trustee yeah so um and, and i didn't realize going into this that it would be it could be two, two separate people. You could have the, the transaction trustee and then a, a moving forward sort of the overseer and trustee that would, that would manage, help manage the company going forward. Um, you know, we, we ended up making the decision after, after interviewing a lot of uh, several people that, you know, it's for us, it was more about personality and fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we wanted somebody that could bring some common sense approach to, um, that role. And, and I think the, who we chose was, I mean, if nothing else, he's, he's a very common sense guy. I mean, he's, 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 he uh, uh, for us, it was a great choice. So yeah. I, I, I just think, um, you know, what they do, we're still learning some of that about what they do. I, I think as we go through the end of the year process, we'll, we'll see a little bit more. Um, but, you know, just having somebody that's easy to speak to and they're not trying to, to act like the big expert in the room and, and, and make you act like you don't know anything mm-hmm. is, is key. I mean, we yep. wanted somebody that just had that, you know, that we were comfortable with. And, yeah. and I think that's the key thing. Who, who are you comfortable with? They're there to work with you, not against you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and once you realize that, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, you got this, this trustee is coming in. He's running the company. No, that's not, they're just there to oversee and make sure everything's complying with, what should be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, your board, your, your executive team is still the ones pulling the, pulling the levers and, and, and doing thing all the day to day. And, and, and I don't, you know, it was who we were comfortable with, which is who we, why we chose ours. That's cool. No, it's so going in from there, I know that the, one of the next natural steps is we have to prepare to do a, a presentation for the site visit. And you guys did like a phenomenal job, like, cause you had your key people there at the meeting um, what sort of, did you have anxiety to that? Like when you were, when we were working through that step of the process, cause we're going to have in this moment, we're going to have the trustee that we just hired, the valuation firm that we just hired come in, um, and really like go through like who you guys are as a company. And, and, you know, the, the goal of that is to really under, help them understand what you, what you do, who does it. So did you have any anxiety with that or how did that go for you guys? Um, I wouldn't say anxiety. I, I, I was very comfortable through the whole process. And I, and I think I, I'm a pretty type A personality that wants to, to make sure everything, you know, it, the agenda items are all complied with and we're on time and we're all, yeah. but I, I think, you know, for us, the process was, um, we had done these type of things before because we belong to several groups where we share numbers and we're not afraid to speak about, you know, what we do and how we do it and what our numbers are and, and all these things. So, I think for the executive team, it was a little bit of a learning process just because, um, 
we, we were very quick to get our marketing. Uh, we've got a mark, two person marketing team. We got them involved. Uh, we sort of standardized everything. Uh, we sort of, you know, made sure the presentations were the same. And, and then, you know, it's just a matter of what content did the, the valuation company, the trustee, yourself, what, 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 what did everybody want to see? What was, what was important to them? Mm-hmm. Uh, and having, you know, I think you got to start from the basics. You got to, you got to explain the industry a little bit. You got to explain your business a little bit. And then you got to dive into the numbers. And, you know, we, we practiced a couple of times. We, we ran through it a couple of times just to make sure everybody was, uh, comfortable. Um, not everybody's a great presenter or speaker when they get up in front of people. So we walk through that a little bit, but, um, I, you know, I, I, I was surprised when yourself and, the trustee both said, Hey, this is probably one of the best presentations we've ever seen. I was like, was that good? Well, yeah. You know, we just, we just try to standardize it. We tried to make yep. it very simple, standardize it, uh, and make sure everybody was engaged. I thought it was more important that the trustee, the valuation company and yourself get to see our team, mm-hmm. get to see the people that are going to run the company moving forward, um, and get comfortable with them and that they do know what they're doing. Um, and that was the the key thing for us. Yeah. And I, I fully, I mean, if it's possible, I love that when you can get the key people in front of the trustee, because it gives them a sense for, you know, when you talk about depth of people, like your management depth, or you talk about these types of attributes or strengths in a company, when you can see it, sit there and see it, I mean, they're articulate, they know their business, they know what they're doing. Um, it just, it just strengthens the, the presentation Ultimately, that goes into getting us all set up for finalizing due diligence and the negotiation. So it's, I'd say it's a critical step in the whole process, but the way you guys did it um, was really, really well done. And I think you had what, like eight people there? I can't remember exactly, but I believe so. I believe, yeah, somewhere around six, six to eight. Six to eight people. Right. So, you know, so some people might be thinking, how many should I have in that? So it, the way, the way you guys did it is you had these, these, um, sections that were kind of like five, 10 minute sections for each of these people. So we didn't, we didn't have to have somebody come in and talk an hour. It was just enough to be like, Hey, this is what you're going to talk about. Move on to the next person. And, and then we rolled through it pretty, pretty effectively. So I thought that was, that always stood out to me for, for my own experience that that was a really good way to go. And that was purely your idea. And it was really, yeah. Cool. And I think the whole, the whole, for us, the whole, um, notion was to get the trustee and the valuation company very comfortable. They already knew the numbers. They, they, they've seen the financial, they've known the numbers. By that point, we've gone back and forth a few times and talking about things, Mm -hmm. but to understand our business and who the people are, they're going to help drive it to the next level. I think that was the more important thing. I, I totally right. agree. I totally agree. We didn't, we didn't want to get in there and regurgitate yeah. you know, the financials and hash this out. No, we, we, it was none of that. It was just, you know, why are we successful? Mm-hmm. What makes us successful over some of the other companies out there that sell hot tubs? Yeah. So I think that was the, the more important thing. You know, and I know, I know this is a question that I get from people all the time. And as we go through these things, what point did you let your key people know that they were going to, that you were thinking about doing an ESOP? So my number two, he, he, he was very early in the process. Matter of fact, he, he went to some of the conferences with me just to, get his familiarization with it. And he was a very big opponent or proponent of mm-hmm. an ESOP. Obviously he didn't want to see some private equity or some, mm-hmm. some other public company come in. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause that's a tough road. You know, do, do they get rid of management? Who do they get? You know, what's the whole look for? So he was a big proponent of, of going the ESOP route. And then probably, uh, let's say we start, me and you started working together in basically July Yep. Of last year. We started working on a timeline of when we want to do it. And I think in uh, January, February, we brought the rest of the executive team in for a close at the end of April, Mm -hmm. beginning of May. So, you know, probably about three months before, three to four months before the process, we started bringing some executive team members in to let them know what was happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were some suspicious there, any suspicion there anywhere. Uh, I know they all thought we were going to sell to a, 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 public company mm. that was out there buying some companies up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that it, it's probably a three to four month process before that. Yeah. But to keep that close knit and, and a close knit group, um, 
And that was just our approach. I, I've heard of other companies that told everybody when they first started doing it. But what I didn't want to do is go through the process, it, it, it not work or it, it not succeed. And then we have to go another route. And then everybody doesn't understand all the nuances. I the, totally agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that because it's it's like I hate would, I would hate to create an expectation that everybody's thinking something and then you pull and you pull and, and jive over here and do something completely different. So you just want to keep that that opening, like because sometimes you just not. I, I I tell people you know you got to prove it out. Like, is it really going to work? Because there's some things that you just don't know yet, you know, when you get into it. But but your key yeah. people, I think that's that was essential to get them in, involved when you did. Um, so so we finished all the due diligence. Then we started negotiation. Um, when you know, and this is something that I'm I'm just talking to some people about this week. Actually, um, it's so it's such an interesting way that negotiation happens because we make an offer, then they make a counter offer. The trustee does so, and then and then we make another counter offer. So so there's this back and forth. When we started that process, and I know, I know, I kind of set you up to kind of like let you know what was going to happen. But were you surprised by any of that, or did you expect something different? Or no, I, I think me and you had probably talked about it enough that I was very comfortable with it. I, I knew that you know, just like any negotiation, we're going to start at a number, they're going to start at a number, but that's not our. I'm not going to say that's not our real number. That's our. That's our. We'd love to have number, but we. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you, you come to some kind of agreement somewhere there in the middle with, with some terms and conditions. And and I, I didn't find anything surprising at all. I, I thought it was right on target. Uh, I think when me and you first started the whole process uh, over a year ago, you, you would ask me what what when, what my number was. And I, I remember my response to you was, I don't have a number. Let's let the let's let the numbers prove out what the number is going to be. Yep. That's um, great. And, and, and that's I think. For me, that was, you know, I, I wasn't going to be unrealistic. If, if the number said we were going to get X, then we were going to try to get X. But if the number said we were going to get more than X, then we were going to try to get more than X. And, and I didn't want to come into it with a preconceived notion that I had to have this amount to mm-hmm. do this. Um, yeah. Because I can't look when you get ready to sell your business or ease off your business or do whatever you're at, your numbers are your numbers. You can't, you can't go in at that point and change your numbers just to make, you know, your retirement number look better. So mm-hmm. uh, I was, I was very uh, okay with all of that. So I think that's a very healthy mindset. And I can tell you, it's not always the case in the sense. And I, and I think it's a good point to think about people thinking about this specific situation. Like, what am I going to sell it for? If it goes ease up, um, I've had a couple conversations over the last two weeks with some different companies, but you know, if you can just like, the, for instance, if I can justify, a, a higher market approach value and, and the cash flow doesn't really support it, but the multiples in the market are pushing up higher numbers. I still got to go back and I have to be able to make the cash flow work. You know, I have to make sure that the forecast cash flow doesn't put anybody in jeopardy. And, and I know like in your deal, you know, we did a lot of that in the very beginning. And then we even went back at the end and said, you know what, we'll, we'll stretch out your seller note a little bit longer just to have a little more wiggle room for payments. And you can always pay that quicker but I think there's a there's definitely a combination of two pieces fitting together. The number valuation number has to fit with the what cash flow is available, and that's why I really prefer discounted cash flow to anything, just because it's it's going to be more indicative of the value that connects with cash flow. Um, right. So and I, and I think Phil, we 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 went into it and and sort of we're going to let the numbers tell us what the number was, mm-hmm. and then and negotiate to that. Um, but the other part of that is too. You know, it, it's it's two hats I wear now. As a seller, I wear a hat, and I want to. You know, obviously, you want to try to get as much as you can. Yeah. But then, as you know, the chairman of the board and driving the company, you want to be you know fiduciary responsibility of what the company does. So it's it's sort of that trade off, you know. And, and we talk about look, we got we got this number, but now we're going to get interest. Now we're going to get warrants, and. You know, do we pay off the loan earlier? We're not going to get as much interest, but it's better for the company. And, and you don't want to put the company in such a stress, um, that it's, 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 um, you don't want to put it up under any stress that it's, it's struggling every year to yeah. pay us, this, this debts back. And I, I think, you know, we looked at it 10 different ways and, and, um, we didn't ever see that as a, as a problem. So I, I think. You got to be realistic. You got to be. You can't say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell the company for this number," and then the company, you know, the, the company's under a stress load for the next ten years and can't 
afford to do anything. Yep. It can't afford to grow. It can't afford to, you know, it's just struggling to pay its bills. So yep. we, we want to make sure that was not the case in our, in our instance. I, I just think that's good. That's good planning because everybody sleeps at night and, you know, and it's going to work. And one of the reasons it's, it works so well is you guys are an S corp. You stayed an S corp. You're a tax free ben- um, entity now, which is just um, one of the things that people think about. And and when you actually see that come together now in 23, you guys don't pay the company doesn't pay any, any income tax, and it can divert that money, that cash flow back to paying your note note down. So I think that's one of the reasons ESOPs are so much more successful when compared to other types of avenues. So. Um, so we got through the negotiation. Right. You were fine. And then the closing was anything about the ESOP closing that you, that stood out to you just as, you know, put the, put a bunch of documents together, basically. Is, is a, a bunch of documents would be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of documents. Yeah. Um, no, I think we had a good plan going into it. Uh, we got we got documents early. We reviewed them. Uh, we had some changes. We had some corrections. Um you know, I had two other people involved. My my number two had a, by then had a, a portion of the company that he he benefited from the sale from, and then my wife was the other. Uh, we're fifty fifty holders, so we all had to. I, I think I I probably baby stepped them through that process because I wanted to make sure they understood everything, every document they were getting, everything they were signing, everything. So we all three of us uh, could sign the documents, and it wasn't a problem. Uh, we actually had a couple of meetings before the closing just to do that thing. We would, I would send them the documents, have them read them, review them, and then come with questions and we'd talk our way through. I think there was a couple of times, Phil, we brought you into the conversation mm-hmm. to answer some questions. Um, but it was important that everybody, cause look, I, I, I had done, I had been very involved in, in understanding what an ESOP was and, and, and all the little nuances and all the little things for closing. So I wanted to make sure those those two people had the same knowledge that I had and wasn't just signing something that they didn't know what they were signing. So. Yeah, which is really responsible, honestly. I know that sometimes people get intimidated by documents because they're written by attorneys and there's 15 million pages and yeah. all that. But for you to, to be able to do that, it was really helpful. And sometimes people use another advisor, like an attorney advisor, to help them sort through all that. But um you know, you just want to know. Uh, my what advice would be take a week off. Take a week. The there you go. And, uh, you know, that way you, your mind's clear and you can you can just concentrate on that stuff and, and, and work through it. And, and yeah. I think for me that that helped a bunch. Just just getting out of the office and sitting at the house and, and reviewing the documents. And then uh, because it is a lot of documents, I, I think I counted. I think it was all four, over 400 pages of, mm-hmm. of documents. So. Yep. Um, it, it's not, it's not so hard that this can't be overcome. It's just one of those things you, you take it one bite at a time and, and yep. knock it out. So, yep. Super good. So kind of final question, I would just say, you know, now you, we close become boom, you're an ESOP company. Um, what in, in, you guys went through and did a normal, like rollout meeting, you got everybody together. What stood out to you in the rollout meeting, which is basically, Hey, we're announcing this to my, to my employees. And how did the employees react when you guys did that? Yeah. Good question. You know, we're, we're spread out a little bit. We have six, we have eight locations with two warehouses. Um, so we have people all over North Georgia. So, um, we had to bring in, figure out how to bring in 90 something people into one location uh in may may uh, may 3rd i think it was may 2nd may 3rd um two or three days after the closing and there was all kind of rumors flying you know what, what what's going on where everybody's being brought in the, this never happens right we we always have company day where we bring people up and do do things but we we disguise it a little bit as a, a charitable event we want to do a big charity thing luncheon a little appreciation luncheon charity event mm-hmm. um so we brought everybody in and and did that and basically we had put together a board of people including um some experts uh from your office and, and other people that had come in to help us answer questions right because we knew we were going to have a town hall meeting after after we made the announcement uh we knew we were going to get a lot of questions and we were not the experts in the field to answer some of these questions uh and we didn't want to give out bad information right we wanted to give out the correct information uh, even though af- right after the closing, there's some details that are still foggy, I would say, because you just got to firm up some stuff after the, after the close, uh, that usually takes about 30 days, 30, four to six weeks to, to finalize some stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's normal. Yep. Um, you know, you're not going to have some of your final stuff's not going to be right there because you, you got to base it on the, the numbers that run through the closing so that you can't 
close a month and do the closing within a day. So, um, so the, the rollout went great. We, we had a, a great announcement. Uh, I think everybody thought I was going to, you know, bring a company up that had just bought the company and it scared everybody, but, uh, the reaction was great. The, the engagement was great at that point. And then after everything was done, we had lunch and then the big, uh, bike bill had everybody in a bike build for a, a big charity here in town. So oh, cool. it, it just, yeah. it was a great day. I mean, it was, yeah. it was all tied together. We had, you know, we, we had some experts that had done this before and, and relied on them and leaned on them a little bit to, to tell us some things that would work and not work. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and we're about to do our, our, uh, first evaluation or, uh, uh, earnings report mm-hmm. yep. to the employees. So that'll, that'll be a good, um, That'll be a good exercise and, and we're going to see how, how engaged they are with that. So they're actually doing that on the company outing. Um, they're, they're doing a big company outing that the whole company will be together. Then we're going to announce. Nice. Yeah. Uh, that their, their statements will be in their, in their mailbox. Nice. So, nice. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. No, it's, that's, that, that's the stuff that people want to talk about too, which is, of course, you know, we don't have time to get into that as much, but you know, I think that you guys have kicked off a good communication strategy and, and obviously that's going to be an important part of building the, uh, the yeah, we did a couple culture. of things during the kickoff that I thought were pretty cool. You know, obviously we had shirts. I'm an owner, uh, shirts for everybody. And then we had these big signs that set up. So we did big group photos and I, you know, it's just, I think it was, um, everybody was still in shock a little bit or trying to figure out what, what was in it for them sure. or what, what was yeah. There has to be something wrong because nobody just gives me part of a company. No, right? exactly. Yeah. Nobody just, yeah, there, there's got to be a catch here. Where's the catch? So I, I think a lot catch. of people were looking for the catch, but yep. have realized that, you know, business goes on as usual. And uh, it'll be interesting to see after this first uh, yeah. or, or the statement of, of what their stock is worth mm-hmm. and uh, see, see where that goes from there. Yeah. They probably all just start Googling ESOP. Like what's an ESOP kind of thing. And, right, you know, right. That's kind of normal, but I, I love that. I mean, that, that, that is, I would just say that the communication strategy is so important that you just don't have a rollout meeting. There needs to be things like you're doing, like the, the sharing. Yeah. And we've, 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 like I said, we have a small marketing department, so we've, we've gotten them involved with our monthly newsletter and all the stuff internally that we do. We've made sure ESOP is now a piece of everything we do. Every communication, everything is, is, you know, we talk about it. We, we, you know, talk about ownership. We talk about what ownership is and, and we're starting to see a little bit of um, people understanding that what they do and how they spend money and what, you know, how they do things and officially affects the whole company. I think we're starting to see a little bit of that more and more. So it's, it's yeah. very interesting. It's cool. Dynamic. It's very interesting. Well, thank you so much for answering all that. That was really, really helpful. I know that um, people on in uh, the country are going to listen to this and they're going to be like, oh, you know, and there may be a retailer. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to inter- interview you because you had that. A lot of these businesses are construction or um, architectural firms, you know, so being a retailer isn't as common as being in, a, in an employee owned company. Um, so so it's kind of cool for that. So I really appreciate you being on the, the, the podcast today. Well, Phil, I appreciate you having me. And, and, you know, anytime I can help you or anybody else in the East Side, is thinking about it, I'm, I'm there and available. So. so I would finally plug like Georgia Spa. If you're in Northern Georgia and you need a hot tub, you know where to get one because it's an employee owned company. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe you get like a hot tub sale out of this. Who knows? There you go. Yeah. I appreciate it. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, for everybody else, thank you for listening today and we will see you on this next step on your journey to an ESOP. 